by the time we get to this point, like some angry track nerd will will already have tweeted to you. Of course. How it dare is. you confuse one world class mother with the other world class mother? This is why <laughs> you don't like. You know, a few weeks back, Dave Zirin, whom we call Dave Shugamas, tried to warn us that if you fans get out of hand, you're going to wind up getting kicked out of the stadium, like, as a group. You were asking about solutions. I think, you know, the, the first step is going to have to be finding teams if there are fan incidents, which then puts pressure on management and ownership to make sure there is enough security to make sure that these things either get taken care of or there is a presence that says no. So it puts it on the team to make sure that there's a safe environment for the players. That's going to have to be step one. And I hope there are more steps before we go the European soccer route, because that is a very, very dystopian place to be. Told us this was going to happen. People didn't listen. Well, you know what? You should have listened to Dave Stradamus because FIFA has now told footy fans in Mexico that they cannot come to international games because uh, they will not stop showering the other team with homophobic slurs. So there's gamesmanship, there's uh, rowdy fan behavior, but there's also a line. The Mexico's fans crossed it and FIFA did what they felt they had to do, which is exactly the thing that Dave Stradamus said that some organization was going to have to do, which was keep fans out of the stadium. Dave Zirin, Welcome back. Uh, take your victory lap. Well, it's it's a tragic victory lap. I mean, this was something that I uh, did not want to see, but something that was painfully predictable. The hope is that the present will not be prologue and we won't see this in the NBA, which is my big fear. That's going to be up to the fans, though. But mm -hmm. I guarantee you that Adam Silver is looking at this as possibly something that they have to go towards if fans continue the behavior that we've seen throughout these playoffs. Listen, Dave, you're gone last week, man. It's, it's it's great to have you back, just like it's great to have all the viewers back. This is season 2.5. I want to say it's episode three. I, I lost count. I hope you all are keeping better count than I am of Bring It In with Morgan Campbell, where we talk about a lot of stuff. I don't do this by myself. I have with me the best panel in the business in Washington, D.C., rocking the unapologetically black T-shirt. Megan McPeak, tell us how you're doing. I am doing well. And if I can just very quickly touch on what Dave said, do, do it's it. not just... It's not also just the fans saying things to the players. You also have to have respect for your, your fellow fans because yes. we've now seen in two instances among Phoenix Suns fans where they've gotten into fights. The first one, I get it. He was defending himself. That's fine. Still shouldn't be fighting, but he had to defend himself. But the second one between the fans and between the Clippers and the Phoenix fans, y'all just look stupid by fighting each other. You're trying to do it for clout. Just stop because you're going to ruin it for everybody else. I missed that. There was a Clippers, yeah. a Clippers Suns fight. Yes, they basically tried to reenact what that Suns fan experienced in Denver with the Denver fans, and yeah, it was just it was un they're doing it for clout, they're doing it for likes, and you're gonna ruin it for everyone. So just stop the stupidity. Yeah, this is the grown up equivalent. Yeah. This is the go ahead, Dave. To just and, and Devin Booker taking that first fan, even if he was defending himself and saying that he's going to give him courtside seats and a lot of swag gear, all you're doing is valorizing that kind of behavior. And so I'd like to see that stop as well. I mean, I know there's nothing Devin Booker appreciates more than internet clout, but he needs to take a step to the side and say, what's in the best interest of the league? Yeah, especially because these people are fighting on the street, like without medical attention. These are not professional fighters. Like people get hurt. Doing oh, this. the Clippers and, Phoenix one looked like it was still in the arena. It looked yeah. like it was on the concourse. Mm -hmm. Right. People get hurt doing it. And not the least of which, like the person throwing the punches. Like there's a reason why boxers wear gloves and it's not to protect the person getting punched. It's to keep you from breaking your hands on somebody's skull. Uh, not a lot of boxing this week, but we got a lot on the docket. Uh, Olympic stuff, we are one month out from the Olympic Games, so we're going to talk Olympics. We are going to talk uh, the coronavirus pandemic, especially as it relates to the NFL, as usual. And we are also talking <laughs> burritos, food trucks, authenticity, <laughs> tall tales. Uh, we are ready to go. So let's, let's, you know what, let's get into it. Um, so this news broke late last week. Uh, American distance runner Shelby Houlihan, she is the... American record holder in the 1500 meters, the 5,000 meters, and among American distance runners, she was one of the people who actually kind of had a chance to win uh, a medal in Tokyo in these Olympics that look like they're they are actually going to happen. Shelby Houlihan's problem was that back in December, she had a positive test for a drug called Nandrolone. 
Um, and so she went and fought this test finding, took it to the court of arbitration in sports. So for the last seven months, this thing has been tied up in court. Right before the U.S. trial started, which was last week, Friday, uh, CAS handed down their ruling. They said, your appeal is denied. You're suspended for four years because you uh, tested positive for Nangelone. You gave us an explanation. We don't believe the explanation. You couldn't explain where these drugs came from. All we know is that the test says they came from outside your body. So you are banned for four years. That didn't stop USATF from initially allowing uh, Shelby Houlihan to run. She was on the start lists uh, for one of those races because the 5K and the 1500 were on the same day. At least one of those races she was entered in and was going to get to run until like this popular uprising uh, from, uh, from runners, including an open letter signed by at least 30 athletes, some of them very prominent in the US saying, hey, you are setting the absolute worst precedent here. This person is already banned. And so, uh, <laughs> I know for me, and we're going to get to the second half because I promised you guys burritos. We're going to get to burritos in a minute. Um, but I know for me, the thing, the detail that told me that uh, something was wrong, that this was all wrong, was when uh, Shelby Houlihan's coach, Jerry Schumacher, um, from the Bowman Track Club, he said in his statement, I want to pull it up and get it right, uh, January of this year, I was no notified that Shelby had recorded a positive test in December for 2020. The positive test was for a substance called Nangelone, something neither Shelby nor I had ever heard of. You're a professional track coach, right? In this environment where positive tests for all kinds of drugs, Nangelone included, happen all the time and you've never heard of this drug. Like if I get accused of credit card fraud, it's one thing to say I didn't do credit card fraud. Something else to say I have never heard of credit card fraud. Everybody's heard of credit card fraud. So my question to you, Zave Zyron, is Shelby Houlihan's tale to explain this. Is it as tall as Chris Stapp's Porzingis or is it mm -hmm. as tall as Taco Fall? Oh, I mean, I think you got to bring out Manute Bowl's collective family and have them <laughs> sit sand on each other's shoulders to find the tallness of the story. Look, about the credit card comparison, it would be like being accused of credit card and saying you've never heard of American Express. Yes. Sandra Lone is, the, is the, some, some top of the line stuff that anybody who even has a passing interest in track and field knows what that is. Um, I but, think- but, 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 but in fairness, Dave, only, the only previous Nandrolone positive tests were, were from really obscure athletes like NFL Hall of Fame, NFL star Sean Merriman and uh, Roger Clemens. Other than that, no one's ever heard of any of these oh. people testing positive for Nandrolone. Right. No, Roger who? I mean... Right. Go ahead, Dave. It, Sorry. No, no, no. It, it's just to say that I think that, I mean, if, if athletes have learned nothing else, and clearly they haven't over the last generation, is that if you get caught, I mean, you, you own it and you move forward and it becomes a one-day news story. When you try mm -hmm. to manipulate it, when you try to finesse it, when you try to excuse it, then it becomes something that folks like us talk about <laughs> and then it becomes even more of a story. When you try to um, do excuses on top of it, everybody knows the cover-up is worse than the crime, especially in modern media. And that that news hasn't gotten uh, to, to the track and field world is actually kind of shocking. So we, we know what the drug is. We know that the fraud took place and we know that there need to be repercussions. And I think when they try to move beyond that with excuses and stories and tall tales, they're really just taking a bad problem and making it worse. But now, this wasn't just a tall tale. Now, because here's where we... Uh, listen, I'm going to show myself out. Here's where we get to the meat of the issue. Oh, my right? God. <laughs> <laughs> a dad joke following Father's Day. I love it. <laughs> exactly. Mm. And so uh, Shelby Houlihan and her team... Uh, and, and, and I think the lawyer had a really, her lawyer had a really heavy hand in crafting this story. They have to explain where this Nandrolone came from because I was taking some version of the drug. It's not, and it is not a story people want to hear. So what she says is, and I hope I can find this. Okay. We concluded, this is Shelby Houlihan in an Instagram statement. We concluded, we meaning she and her lawyers and her team, uh, that the most likely explanation was a burrito purchased and consumed approximately 10 hours uh, before the drug test from an authentic Mexican food truck that serves pig offal, O-F-F-A-L, although it does taste A-W-F-U-L, like I'm not out here eating organs, but hey, what can you do? Uh, near my house in Beaverton, Oregon, 
Oregon. So this is the official explanation that an authentic mm. Mexican food truck sold her uh, a supercharged burrito topped with Nangelo. Megan McPeak, when you go to your local uh, Mexican restaurant, they give you the choice between carne asada and pig stomach. Which one do you put in your burrito? Uh, probably neither, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, and I love, I love Mexican food. And the fact that she's made this decision along with her team to throw this business now under the bus, because this is not just going to affect her credibility. Her credibility is out the window. Like, bye. Sorry. They didn't believe it. They saw through it. Smoke screen banned you. Accept it and move on. What I would love to see is, especially track uh, athletes, get better PR people in your circle so yes. that they can tell you, listen, to Dave's point, just come to terms with it, admit it, and move on because it'll be 24 hours and the next story will kick in. The moment you try to cover it up, it ends up being 48 72 like we don't need all that you don't need it just accept what you did and move on when you apologize and say you were wrong typically you're forgiven next time and by next time i mean we forget about it and we allow you to just go on with your life but the moment you try to keep covering it up is disgusting and it's just going to end up bad then you now take a business which really and truly had nothing to do with this entire <laughs> story you decided to do something wrong they had nothing to do with it now you're putting their business on the line you're jeopardizing them making money and being able to take care of their family you're now putting them in a position where they they didn't want to be in the media circuit for this they probably want to be in the media circuit for the fact that they have great tasting food great <laughs> prices and it's something good and authentic You've now flipped their entire business on its head when they wanted nothing to do with it. And let's be real, supercharged pig stomach, come on now. <laughs> Girl, nobody's believing you. Okay. Dave, we don't know. We're, we're not about that life. Go ahead, Dave. Just talk about a taco fall. <laughs> <laughs> See, Megan, again, uh, reaffirms her reputation as the person here that believes in people uh, because Megan, uh, has enough faith in Shelby Houlihan's team to think that this taco truck actually exists. And I am skeptical. I will not believe this taco truck exists until I see this taco truck. You know why? Because they're in Beaverton, Oregon. Oregon. You know what there's no shortage of in Beaverton, Oregon is world-class athletes. Like there are so many high level distance running clubs there. And so now you're gonna tell me that there is a, a truck there that's selling uh, meat that will make you test positive. And you're not gonna spread the name of this taco truck amongst the community. Cause this could now get any of your friends. And so let's get back to this word authentic because this is where it gets like, it's fun to make fun of Shelby, Shelby, Houlihan, Shelby Houlihan in this tall tale, but there are some really ugly undertones to all of this. So now she said she got this um, tainted meat from an authentic Mexican food truck. So this word authentic Mexican food truck is supposed to signal to the audience that they have some type of shady, second rate, dirty supply chain that, you know, a, a reputable American business wouldn't have. Uh, the problem with the word authentic, the, well, the other problem with the word authentic is that Shelby Houlihan said that she ordered carne asada. She said she got, she ordered beef and somehow they gave her pig and not even like a uh, pork chop, but like pig organs, which like, Megan, you, your dad's from Scotland. Can you tell the difference between a lamb chop and haggis? Like, yeah, exactly. I don't, even, but, I don't even like haggis and I can tell the difference. Exactly. But you're telling me these authentic Mexicans couldn't tell the difference between steak and a pig stomach. This is not likely. Uh, not to mention the fact that like all the uh, eating pork can trigger a positive test for Nandrolone if that pork comes from a pig that has not been castrated. And if you eat 11 ounces of it, which are two very big ifs, especially considering the fact that one, Shelby Houlihan is not a big person. So for her to eat 11 ounces of pig stomach, not knowing that it's pig stomach and not steak is unlikely. And two, like the percentage, this is one of the things we learned over the weekend because you start Googling this stuff. Um, <laughs> Is that the percentage of uncastrated meat from uncastrated pigs that makes it into the food supply is minimal, like less than a percent. So you're asking all these, all these really, really, really outrageous propositions. But again, 
what Houlihan's team is trading on is the idea that this story coming from this white person is going to carry weight, especially as it relates to brown people and what they eat and what their supply chain is. Like Dave Zirin, um, like with a story like this, because I've seen some some coverage in, in reputable outlets that essentially take Houlihan at her word. Um, like how quickly, like if this story like this was coming from a Kenyan or an Ethiopian, like how quickly would we dismiss it? Uh, very, very quickly. I mean, one, one reason for the statistical mentions that you provide, uh, the second is, I mean, th there is no magical, authentic Mexican food truck in Beaverton, Oregon. Like they, they would have to produce existence of such a thing. And if there is one, it's being driven by Victor Conti. <laughs> There's a name for you from 2005 for all you nostalgia experts. We used to all know Victor Conti and be able to picture him at will. But basically, he was the supplier of choice to many a major leaguer. So look, if Victor Conti's not driving the truck, I don't believe it exists. Here's our man Cole Beasley. Buffalo Bills wide receiver who, and a guy like who has defied the odds in a lot of ways, right? His little wide receiver, uh, a white guy. He's very much like uh, Wes Welker, like a poor man's Wes Welker, poor man's Dan Danny Amendola still in the league playing with Josh Allen. Um, and he has found himself in the news. And he's not a guy that winds up in the news a lot because he's a role player, but he's in the news because not only um, does he not want to get vaccinated, like he is vehemently against getting vaccinated. Um, so he had a quote the other week and people clowned him for it. So he came back with uh, the, <laughs> the public statement medium of choice, right? The iPhone note screenshotted and posted on Instagram. He says, uh, I'll be out in public if you're, not you are, but if you're scared of me, then steer clear or get vaccinated, point blank, period. I may die of COVID, but I'd rather die actually living. Um, Dave Zirin, is this a responsible attitude to take when you work in an environment that like necessitates you butting heads and breathing and slobbering on people? No, I mean, two things. First of all, he called that statement a public service announcement when it served nobody except himself and his future job prospects at Fox News. <laughs> uh, the second thing is I'd like to love to ask Cole Beasley how many times he's taken Toriadol, how many times he's taken painkillers, how many times he has uh, has relied upon the medicine of human beings that human beings have created to get him on that football field and see if he has the same attitude about that as he does to vaccinations. But there, it, the, the Cole Beasley thing, you know, it's, it could be seen as a small story, small in stature, just like the player himself, but it points to a couple of point, things that I think are very worrisome. The first is something that we've talked about uh, previously on this show, which is the mood of reaction in the world of sports in 2021. Uh -huh. And we've seen it in fan behavior. We've seen it in the French Open and all the Open's responses to Naomi Osaka. And my fear and concern is that we're also seeing it in hearing some of the most reactionary voices. And this is a reactionary statement about COVID from Cole Beasley uh -huh. um, that's very at home among the far right in the United States. But like this idea that he feels confident enough to put this out that he feels like this sense of emboldenedness to say this to me is very disturbing. And it's reflective of the entire Buffalo Bills franchise where quarterback Josh Allen uh, was very skittish about saying about whether he thought people should get vaccinated. And then the entire, this is so shameful, but then the entire organization after Josh Allen's comments and in the, in the wake of everything that's going on with Cole Beasley, they've gone from having a policy of having, uh, you know, show that you've been vaccinated to get into the stadium. That was their policy, you know, as many mm -hmm. private businesses do to saying, well, we're just going to take people at their at their word and that's really problematic and then the last thing i'll say about this is th there's a very sort of disturbing mood that i'm hearing among nfl players that it's almost like a point of it's becoming like a point of machismo almost like do you take the vaccine it's like well i'm not going to tell you that and you know what god's watching over me i don't care about you know, the, like the vaccine or whatnot, when when they have this incredible public platform and they could be doing so much right now to spreading the word that it's important to be vaccinated, particularly given their job, as you mentioned, Morgan, but also particularly just, just given their, their place, their elevated mm -hmm. place in the culture, like what they could be doing relative to what they are doing in terms of what they're saying about COVID is, is very disturbing. Right, and the fact that he plays in the NFL tells you that he's comfortable with a certain level of risk so and, and this is an arbitrary place to draw the line and that to me is actually fine 
just like in the last uh, segment, if you just phrase it that way and say, hey, look, uh, I have this really weird relationship with risk. I'll risk my life every week. I think a needle is dangerous or there are other needles I'll take, but this one I won't. And that's that. Instead of trying to pretend like there's a deeper, uh, more principled reason behind it when clearly there isn't. And Vienna, you mentioned it and Elena Bergeron from the New York Times mentioned it on Twitter. And she said, well, they should just mix in the vaccine with the Toradol and everyone will take it. And the NFL players and their relationship with needles and, and substances with unknown or suspected really harmful long-term effects is really strange. Like if you, there's a, there's a podcast and it shows up on YouTube too. It's called All Things Covered and it's Bryant McFadden, longtime defensive back for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's retired now. And Patrick Peterson, who is still playing. I think he's with the Vikings now. And they had uh, Santana Moss on there. So Santana Moss was, uh, yeah, a really good receiver. He was like a Cole, Cole Beasley sized guy with unreal speed. And um, they had him on there talking about uh, certain games, like if he was injured and feeling anxious, he would take Toradol, but also take a shot of Hennessy. Now, Megan McPeak, which of those two substances do you think made the hosts uh, do a double take? Was it the Toradol or the Hennessy? Probably the Hennessy. Exactly. So people will just line up and get this needle and take a full body anal analgesic, right? So they don't feel pain at any point during the game, knowing or suspecting that years from now, they're going to regret having done this because this drug has effects. But the Hennessy, which any of us can get in a store, is somehow like the strange thing. So how do you like, how do you, how do you impress upon the Cole Beasley's of the world that, um, you're not just doing this for you, that you have like a family and a community that functions better if you're protected and they're protected? Quite simply, you can't. They, they're they going to think the way that they want to think. They're going to feel the way that they want to feel. And at the end of the day, that is their, that's their right. That's their, that's their opinion. They can have whatever opinion they'd like to have. And first of all, I would just wish that he would learn to differentiate between your and your um that's you know that's that's number one on my books is let's let's spell correctly when we're going to put out a quote-unquote public service announcement and make sure that we're using the correct grammar and spelling so that uh you know the role models that you are as athletes you have young kids reading this and thinking that they're going to be using the correct version of your <laughs> when they in fact will not be uh, so that's number one number two is you could have just kept this to your damn self like I didn't, I didn't need this. You could have easily kept this to yourself. You could have made a very simpler statement and said, mm -hmm. taking the vaccine or not taking the vaccine is a personal decision that I will be making by myself along with my family and my medical staff. I'd like privacy and respect for my own privacy. It's not your public information. Could have left it there too. Instead, you decided to make this spelling incorrection, this grammatical error driven, uh, so-called public service announcement that was asinine on your part and makes you look dumb because you are filling it and spewing it with information that the COVID conspiracy theorists will now take and run with as they mm. conveniently always do. That Olympic gravy train is about to keep rolling. We're a month out and in spite of all of the concerns about whether or not this would happen, it looks like it's happening. Um, we're a month away. Uh, Dave Zirin, I want to ask what sport you are most looking forward to seeing in this Olympics that now looks like it's happening. The caveat being, we each have to choose a sport that's not one of our main sports. So people know me as a boxing boxing fan and a track and field fan. So I'm going to choose my top non-boxing track and field sport. Megan's a basketball person. She got to pick her top non-basketball sport. Dave Zirin, what is... Uh, the sport you're most looking forward to seeing from outside your traditional wheelhouse? Well, I got to say, maybe I've spent too much time around um, Tommy Smith and John Carlos and whatnot, but I I'm like a DL 200 meter fanatic. Yes. I find the 200 meters to be one of the most interesting races, the combination of distance and sprinting. And John Carlos really taught me that, you know, running is not just running. 
you know that there, there is a total art to it i mean it's kind of like music in a way where anybody can enjoy music but for people who really know music they enjoy it on a whole different level and the same thing goes for sprinting i believe um because everybody has access to it because everybody has run in their life mm -hmm. now the 200 meter this year but but to know it is to know it now the 200 meter this year is really interesting because on the men's side you have noah lyles who's one of the more interesting athletes we've seen in some time threw up a yes. fist before the last race um he's, he's a musician as well and he he could i think be one of those people we talk about in a much broader cultural sense once these olympics are over particularly if he pushes back against the anti-protest dictates which is highly possible mm -hmm. um on the women's side obviously there, there's tremendous talent all over the place but one person that i've been really focusing on is a runner named gabby thomas Mm -hmm. And not just because she's a Harvard graduate, not just because she majored in like neurobiology or something that I don't understand or know how to pronounce, but also because, you know, they found a benign tumor. Um, I believe it was in, in her kidney as recently as um, 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 I think it was very recent, like a month ago, and it was found to be benign. So her, her racing dreams are still going on. But she's just a terrific story up and down the line and has some very interesting times. So 200 meters, I'm all over it. I'll be in the front seat with my popcorn. Um, but one thing I'll push back slightly on, Morgan, is you said it looks like these Olympics are happening. Um, you called me Dave Stradamus before. It certainly looks <laughs> like the games will be coming. But the idea that they could come in a truncated form Mm -hmm. going forward because of something happening in Tokyo is something we shouldn't turn our eyes away from. Good stuff. And the 200 meters, I love the 200 meters because it's at almost the same speed as 100 meters, but it's long yeah. enough to have like plot twists. And, yes. and, and like the, the 100 meters has stages and phases, but the 200 meters has all that plus plot twists because you don't know what's going to happen like in the last 50 meters, which makes or breaks so many runners. Good choice, Dave. Megan McPeak, Basketball's off the table. What's the next sport you're you're looking forward to seeing in Tokyo? The hundred meter point blank. <laughs> like, <laughs> especially after the trials and the not necessarily the emergence, but the global emergence. Because if you're a US track, um, if you're familiar with US track or track, if you're a track nut like yourself, Morgan, you know who Shakari Richardson was. Yes. But to the world, they got to know who Shakari Richardson was this <laughs> yes. weekend. And knowing that she's going to go up against an Allison Felix, like I'm totally here for this black girl magic that we are about to get uh, in, in Tokyo. But also, too, I'm interested and it's similar, but not the same. A ball is involved, but I'm very interested to watch handball as it's making mm. its emergence to the Olympics. Uh, and, and friend Matt Weiner will be calling some of that for NBC uh, on their Olympics coverage. So I'm actually very interested to see how that is going to go and how it plays out on the Olympic stage because it is a very competitive sport internationally, but I'm very excited to see how it looks at the Olympics and who comes home with the first gold medal uh, in handball. All right, so for me, uh, you guys know me as a boxing boxing nerd, you know me as a track nerd, so those two are off the table. The sport I'm most looking forward to seeing um, in the Olympics is weightlifting. Uh, specifically like the smaller the person, the more I like watching because the thing that really gets me excited is to see somebody that weighs 60 kilos lift 150 kilos as opposed to seeing a guy that weighs 200 kilos lift 400 kilos. Like I want to see you like the, the, the best of the best get close to three times body weight. Like that very rarely gets done, but you're only going to see it with the little people. I love it. And um, so as a guy, uh, Shi Ziyong from China, Always look forward to him. And I learned on Instagram that he is the lifter. He's in the 73 kilo weight class, but he's the lifter that all the other lifters watch. He's a lifter's lifter. He would be like the Oscar Peterson of weightlifters. Like all the other pianists were like, yo, Oscar, that's my guy. He's perfect. This is how the other weightlifters feel about Xi Ji Young. And then on the women's side, uh, Lady, her name is Lady, Lady Solis. L-E-I-D-Y Solis from Colombia. She won a gold medal here at the Pan Am Games six years ago. And she just has this such a, this sense of uh, it's a discretionary showmanship because either the weight goes up or it doesn't. Like you don't have to strut around, you don't have to make it a presentation, but she just does. And she chooses to. Like there's this iconic picture of her here in Toronto. She made this lift and then she stuck her tongue out to the judges. <laughs> like this is what I live for. So I'm really excited to see a uh, little person weightlifting um, in Tokyo in a month because it. <sighs> 
luck permitting, that's where we are headed. Uh, speaking of the Olympics, uh, we'll let the Olympics transition us into in or out. This is we're in the home stretch. Uh, this week's of uh, this week uh, this week's episode in or out we tee up the topics knock them down real fast to see if the all star panel is in or out on a given topic while we're on the Olympics while I'm looking at you Megan McPeak uh, the no the news just broke overnight ten thousand spectator a uh, ten thousand spectator cap has been implemented for any venue at the Olympics which means like before they weren't talking about any spectators now they can say each venue can have up to 10,000 spectators at the Olympics, but that number does not include like the sponsors and the VIPs. So if 10,000 uh, sponsor VIPs show up, you can have 10,000 more spectators. Um, Megan, we peek you in or out on the 10,000 spectator uh, cap at this summer's Olympics. I'm all the way out because you think of the fact and reading the story, it was almost contradictory of itself. You're allowing mm -hmm. 10,000 spectators. They can only be, Japanese because you have the travel restrictions yeah. but then at the same time you said that you can have 10,000 spectators but also then decided not to differentiate that they had to be only Japanese again it's very confusing how they're making this differentiation is it closed is it open like can people arrive are they vaccinated like what are the restrictions because just saying 10,000 Japanese spectators tells us nothing if you're then gonna say people can come i'm it's i'm out on it just let's do it without spectators because the case count continues to rise in tokyo yeah you could very quickly get to double ten thousand just if you add in like again all the all the administrators and executives and sponsor delegation people that show up that don't count against the 10,000 person cap. And you get 10,000 more people, you get to 15, 20,000 quick. Dave Zyron, you in or out? I'm out and I'm appalled. I mean, why don't they just inject people with the mumps on their way into the <laughs> They would be more effective and more straight up. This is a country with a less than 3% vaccination rate. I looked at this story and my only thought was, what the heck are they doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Dave. I'm with you, Megan. I'm out, especially because the 10,000, like it's not, it's a raw number cap. It's an absolute number cap. It's not a percentage capacity cap. So 10,000 people in a volleyball stadium is very different, pe very different from 10,000 people in a soccer stadium or 10,000 people at a track stadium, especially given that indoors is where it's more likely to spread. Indoors, you have the smaller venues. So now you're telling me uh, I can get more people, like a higher percentage uh, capacity in the venue where the virus is more likely to spread if someone has it, but then in the open air outdoor uh, venue where I can spread people out more and where the, the virus is not gonna jump from person to person as easily, I still have the same uh, number of people. No, it doesn't make sense. And again, if, if you add in uh, all of the important people, all the VIPs that don't count against the cap, we're not talking about 10,000 anymore. We're talking about 15, 20,000. So it, uh, I'm out. I'm out. Um, next up, NCAA. It's 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 a critical week for them, uh, as you know. Well, as Dave and Megan know, we've been following the story for for months. Uh, the NCAA and they've been in in front of Congress. They're trying to get Congress to see if they can pass uh, a nationwide law uh, allowing um, allowing college athletes to profit off their name, image, and likeness, so that you know, like college freshman Zion Richardson. Zion Williamson can go out and get an endorsement deal, which he couldn't do while he was in school. So they're trying to make it, uh, trying to make that part of it make sense, right? And bring these players earning power in line with their fame. Uh, but Congress is saying, look, we are about to uh, head on our midsummer recess. We're not going to get to this before July 1st, but July 1st is the date when all these different states have made laws saying, hey, you can profit, college athlete, you can profit off your name, image, and likeness in my state, Alabama, Georgia. Florida. And so what's going to happen is if the NCAA does not make a move between now and July 1st, you're going to have a bunch of states that have this rule and a bunch of states that don't. And what you're going to have is recruiting chaos, uh, unless <laughs> the NCAA, led by President Mark Emmert, uh, can come up with the rule between now and July 1st. Uh, Dave Zyron, are you in or out on that happening? I'm out on that happening. Uh, the NCAA is a feckless organization. And uh, we're headed towards chaos, um, and that's all there is to it. Yeah, it's chaos one way or the other, which is nuts. Um, <laughs> get to mine in a second. Megan, repeat you in or out. 
I'm out. It's the never cares about athletes organization. Let's be real. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I'm out on that possibility as well. Even though, like, honestly, the simplest thing for the NCAA to do would just be from the NCAA standpoint, say, this is legal. This is in our rule book. Because what people forget, and I was doing a story a couple of years back with a lawyer who has sued the NCAA a few times. His name is Richard Johnson. He's based in um, Cleveland. And he pointed out that like the NCAA is an organization that has its own bylaws. So if you have bylaws in your organization, like it does not matter, like it's not your place to go ask the federal government for help. Like if I have a condo and the condo says, uh, don't grow plants in your unit, like is growing plants illegal in the broader world? No. Is growing plants against the bylaws of this condo? Yes. If I find out my next door neighbor is growing plants in his condo, do I call the uh, FBI or do I just call the condo board? Just mm. call the condo board. Like this is like I'm out on him on the NCAA actually doing this, but this is the simplest thing to do, and they won't do it because <laughs> it's too logical. Do it it yeah. is too logical. And, and, and I'm in on growing plants. Okay, wait a minute. Uh, I'm get I'm getting like literally right now. You guys might have heard the alert on 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 this phone <laughs> growing plants. <laughs> That's legal now too in a lot of ways, especially if you're white. Um, <laughs> but they, uh, Ryan Johnston, RJ, who you hear us refer to sometimes, has just sent me an alert saying that the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, backs payments to athletes. I'm just going to try to read the headline here. This is we're doing this live. NCAA argued that payments were a threat to amateurism that, and that barring them did not violate antitrust laws. Uh, I'm going to read the lead from this New York Times story. This is literally it hit the Internet at 1041 a.m. Eastern Time Monday morning. Uh, the Supreme Court unanimously ruled on Monday that the NCAA cannot bar relatively modest payments to student athletes in the name of amateurism. The decision based on antitrust law came as the business model of college sports is under increasing pressure. Dave Zyron, your first reaction. Uh, first reaction is, is not surprised because of um, in, in the in the testimony that was put forward in the previous context from Supreme Court justices. It was interesting that that they seem to find a broader unity in this very divided court that this was deeply problematic, several of whom, like Justices Kavanaugh and even Justice Thomas, they acted like they were looking at this for the first time and were absolutely shocked at what they saw <laughs> the NCAA operates. So not surprised, very interested to see what flows from here. Megan, what do you, what do you think happens from here? I can't put any faith in the NCAA to do anything correct when it comes to taking care of its athletes. So I, I honestly don't know what will happen from, from this point on. Like I, the NCAA has shown us that they can't be trusted. So why start trusting them now? Yes. Uh, but I mean, what's going to happen is their hand is going to get forced, just like with name, image, and likeness. The Supreme Court has said, and again, there's no reason for the Supreme Court to get involved, right? right. None. Can you pay people to play sports? Yes, there's guys playing golf. Like I can see them right now outside my house. They're playing golf. If I run over to one of them and say, hey, I'll give you $100 to play one more round with me, I can do it. It's not against the law. But if, I, if I'm a college coach and I give them $100, it's against the bylaws of the organization. This is simple. And I don't understand how it's gotten to the Supreme Court. But what I think is going to happen is that uh, the, 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 the teams from the bigger conferences and the teams that have money are going to take advantage of this, right? And so, especially if you're in one of these states with the NIL, like there are any number of ways to make sure people get paid. And so if the NCAA doesn't make a rule against it, and if the court has said, or sorry, if the NCAA doesn't change the rules that are against it, and the court has said, well, technically it's not illegal, right? Because now you, what they're saying is it's, it's going to be a lot harder. Remember the uh, Adidas scandal with the kid from Louisville and the kid from, from, from Michigan State, and people wound up doing time, and the kid wound up having to go to Australia to play? Uh, like that... That type of uh, law enforcement intervention in uh, college sports is going to be a lot harder to pull off because the, the, the Supreme Court has said, no, you can give them some money and everyone knows that that's different from a professional salary. So if you, if you give a person a stipend of 20 grand a year or whatever it is, that's not the same as making, you know, five million a year playing pro. Like this is, again, patently not illegal, just against some bylaws. Last one, if we have time. And next week, we'll get into that one even more. Uh, Megan McPeak, you mentioned her uh, in the last topic. Shakari Richardson, uh, 1086 in the 
in the finals of the US Women's Olympic 100 meter trials, uh, but like a super dramatic, like she spotted the next best person two meters basically out of the first 20 and then just <laughs> hit the accelerator halfway through, made world-class people look like high schoolers. Um, the previous round she ran 1065, it was wind aided, but uh, pulled up about 10 meters out to point at the scoreboard. <laughs> And then turned to the camera and said, y'all better stop playing with me or something to that effect. After the final, she runs up into the stands, hugs her grandma. Like she is, uh, she's all skill and all execution, but also all personality. I'm all the way in on Sha'Carri Richardson. Uh, so what I tweeted on, on Friday night was if you, or Saturday night is if you don't love Sha'Carri Richardson, we can't be friends. Megan McPeak, are you in or out on losing friends over Sha'Carri Richardson? 100%. <laughs> <laughs> a thousand percent i'm all the way in on losing friends i'm all the way in on Shakira richardson if you can't love this athlete then i don't know what to tell you because she said it herself she lost her biological mother a week ago and went out and put on for the entire world if you can't talk like if that's not compartmentalization i don't know what yes. it is because she put everything she left it at the track at the step of the track and said game time and went full blown game time and put on for the world. And she's probably going to put on for the world in Tokyo. I'm all the way in on Shakira Richardson. I am all the way in on her antics. I am all the way in on her showmanship. I am all the way in on everything about her because she is putting the world on notice that I am, as she said, that girl. <laughs> Shakira Richardson between rounds was clapping back at the trolls on Twitter. <laughs> Here for it. Here for all of it. Dave Zyron, you enter out on losing friends over Shakari Richardson. Oh, then they weren't my friends to begin with. <laughs> All I can say, just like mom taught me. <laughs> right? Well, I've drawn my line in the sand. And if you guys aren't Team Shakari, y'all need to find something else to do every Monday morning from 10 to 11. I'm all the way in on Shakari Richardson. I'm all the way in on come from behind wins. Sometimes you hear the, 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 the announcer saying, oh, she didn't get a great start. Well, no, she gets the great start. She gets the start that's right for her. She hits her top speed at the right time. You don't ever see her fade in the back of a race. I'd rather have that than... Um, fading at 60 and watching everyone zoom past you. So Sha'Carri Richardson does not have a bad start. Sha'Carri Richardson has Sha'Carri Richardson's start and her personality and her antics. I am all the way in on it. Um, and I, I cannot wait to see uh, if everybody stays healthy, the women's 100 meter final um, in Tokyo, which should involve Sha'Carri Richardson and uh, Shelby Ann Fraser Price, and maybe Blessing Okabari, who trains with Andre DeGrasse and Trayvon Bramell. And she just ran 10 6 uh, maybe a week ago. It's gonna be blazing hot if we can get there. Um, in the meantime, until next week, Megan McPeak, tell the people where they can find you. On Twitter, as always, at Megan McPeak, spelt with an H because that's the right way to do it. Yes, thank you. And, um, I don't think she mentioned it. I'll mention it. Megan is the play-by-play -play voice of the Washington Mystics and the Capital City Go-Go. Uh, two Washington Mystics on the U.S. Olympic team, which means they, because the Mystics start every game with a 12-0, with a 12 nothing lead by virtue of the fact that Megan McPeak is on the microphone. So these two Mystics on the Olympic team, USA is up. By the, by the time the ball is tipped, USA is already up 3 nothing. Dave Zirin, also in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Tell the people where they can find you between episodes. Yeah, you stick your head out the window and you yell, Dave, I will come running. <laughs> True story. Uh, my little two-year-old daughter, she was watching Bring It In. She saw Dave and she said, Uncle Dave. Mm, <laughs> that's what go. I'm talking about. She also calls Megan Mika, which Ma Mika is uh, my niece. That's the baby's cousin, but she saw Megan. She's like, Mika. So <laughs> I'll take it. There you go. And as usual, I'm your host, Morgan Campbell. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Morgan P. Campbell. I am too old for TikTok, uh, too young probably for Triller. Uh, but you can find me here, find me on Twitter, find me on Instagram. Uh, we record on Mondays, hit the internet Tuesday, Wednesday-ish. But again, it's been my favorite 45-ish uh, minutes of the week and I hope it was yours too. If you like what you hear, hit like, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, leave a comment. If you dislike, same thing, hit dislike, leave a comment. We don't care. All engagements matter. We're just trying to make the algorithm happy. So until next week, this has been Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. I'm your host, Morgan Campbell.